OK. Tick off or shout out six of the ten most common allergic food in children. And let's say in New Zealand. <laughs> All right, so cow's milk, peanut, somebody yeah. said egg. Soy is down there somewhere, yeah. Soy, OK. Kiwi fruit, OK. Yeah, we've had cow's milk already, yeah. Shellfish. So we've got finned fish, if you like, um, and shellfish. Yeah. yeah. OK. Quite often when we're dealing with fish, we're thinking about, is it an oily fish? Yeah. Is it you know, um, a, a, a mackerel or a sprat? Or even salmon and tuna are oily fish uh, compared to the white fish, which is exactly what you'd imagine, uh, compared to the shellfish. But um, of course, we know there's quite a lot of cross-reactivity as well. OK. Any that haven't been said so far? So if we're looking at the common ones, the ones we often look at are sesame, mm -hmm. peanut you've said, tree nuts you've said, egg somebody said, soy, yeah, we got soy, we got cow's milk, we got fin fish, we probably got them all actually. And kiwi fruit is a particular sort of interesting one to me. The ones I sort of think I neglect at times are kiwi fruit and sesame. Yeah. Um, but you, you see quite a lot of sesame um, we and do. kiwi fruit. We do. Yeah. Um, and People who come from the South Island, from Christ, for example, Christchurch, there's a lot of birch, so they're sensitive high as through inhalant birch pollen and develop oral allergy syndrome. But what we see up um, further north is true kiwi fruit and allergy, and some who have had anaphylaxis to kiwi fruit. I guess the only other thing I'd say, I don't know if our clinic's slightly skewed, but we actually see more wheat than soy allergy and see hardly any soy allergy. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd agree with that. Mm. Wheat's a tricky one as well because, again, there's, there's so many other ways that wheat issues can show themselves and there's mass confusion about what you're dealing mm. with. Um, and also, you know, they're just that thing of, you know, are you better off without it or not? Well, I feel better off, then fair enough. Mm. Oh, sorry, wheat was there. Yeah, yep. I just didn't press the last button. All right, what's being done here? What's its relevance? This is a sort of interesting curio. This is rare. It's making a point that, again, we've said about urticarial rashes and that how often people say it's urticarial, it must be allergy, um, but um, especially food allergy. Um, uh, but there are a whole host of physical things that you can do in certain people that will build out urti bring out urticarial reactions. So this is the ice cube test. So you put an ice cube on the skin and in this particular individual, you can see a very clear-cut reaction um, with the outline and a surrounding wheel. So hardly surprising if under certain cold environmental conditions, this may be somebody who develops an urticarial rash. And it's not because of what they've eaten. It's not because they've just started some amoxyl. It's due to a physical factor. And I think we neglect these and don't think about them enough, but they're not that. Um, sort of uncommon. This, this is, um, but there's a few other ones to talk about as well. So it's an ice cube test. It's a test for a physical urticaria. And you won't pit this out unless you know to ask the right questions. Um, and it does have some important, because some of these children, uh, some of these patients rather, with cold um, uh, um, uh, reactions like this can actually have anaphylactic reactions. And mm -hmm. what happens, and tell me if I'm wrong here, they go for a swim. They have their cold anaphylaxis 100 meters offshore. They die and they drown, and it's put down as a drowning accident. Mm. So again, this is hen's teeth stuff. It's not common, but um, you know, it's, it's worth a thought because it makes quite a big difference to make them. And again, just to make that point that we can divide these urticarias ur up, but look at some of the physical ones. So cold contact, we just said about solar. Some people will come out all red and blotchy on exposure to sunlight. Mm. Um, uh, uh, vibratory urticaria, sometimes see as an occupational problem that people working with vibrating machinery will come out in urticarial rashes. <coughs> um, uh, aquagenic urticaria, urticaria linked with contact of the skin with water. Mm. Cholinergic urticaria is ever so common. 
Um, uh, and uh, again, um, uh, we're not going to go into exercise-induced urticaria and anaphylaxis. They're reasonably sort of specialist areas. But all of these physical things that will give you an urticating rash that is not because you've eaten something <coughs> wrong. It's, um, it's a manifestation of, of what physical and environmental things can do. Um, it's still invoking a, a, a sort of an immune dysregulation and reaction, but you're not going to sort this out by doing skin prick tests and restricting a food. All right, this child. She's had some skin prick tests done. How many of you actually see skin prick tests done? Has anybody actually had them done on themselves? Did it hurt? On yourself? Yeah. yeah, I think when you have a positive reaction, and of course you do a positive control, so you get a little itchy thing there. But it's really not like having a blood sample taken. And I often have to spend some time, especially with slightly older children, saying, although it's called skin prick, it really doesn't hurt to have it done. It's not like having a needle for mm -hmm. anything else. But, but it does get itchy. Um, uh, so this child's had a positive control, a negative control, and those results. So on the basis of that, got any clever ideas? Let me give you a hint. The negative control should be with sterile saline. So would you expect a reaction? OK. But there's a strong reaction there, isn't there? Eight millimetres is pretty good going. If you've got an eight millimetre wheel, the parent's going to be saying, oh, what was that one? That's a strong reaction. So immediately what that's telling you is that here's a child who's reacting across the board, but even reacting just to saline. So is this related to the physical trauma, if you like, of having a skin prick? You know, you're actually sticking a needle through skin. Um, so your um, interpretation of that would be, is this linked with dermatographism? So who knows what dermatographism is? This table's looking a bit quiet at the moment at the back. Any thoughts about dermatographism? The clue is in the, is in the word. This is quite literally skin writing. Um, and it's something I quite often do in clinics, is that you just run your thumbnail over somebody's back, it tends to work better on the back than the front, and you'll see some kids come up almost immediately with uh, a wheel with a nice red flare around it. So it's literally skin writing. And if you're doing that, that's not because they're allergic to my thumb, it's not because they've eaten something that day, it's a physical urticaria. Um, there is a performance artist who works out of California, and what she does is she writes poetry on her skin and the idea is that it will only last for a few seconds and never be seen again. Um, which is a good trick if you can do it and it's good at parties. Um, but, um, whoops. Um, but, it, but it's um, a, a manifestation of dermatographism. Here's another skin prick test. You didn't organise this, somebody else did. No clinical indications available to you. Your skin prick test on the spur of the moment because Dad had a day off. So look at the controls again. So the positive control should be positive because what they're injecting is histamine. So you should have a little itchy reaction. But this is very pokey, isn't it? So what might this child have been taking? Yeah, because... <laughs> histamine is the positive control. If you're on an antihistamine, it's going to skew the results. So what advice are you going to give to, to people who are going for skin prick tests? <laughs> You've got to be off an antihistamine. Shannon, any comments about how long you need to be off the modern antihistamines? Oh, you know, sometimes I'll do it if it's been, it's been given three days earlier. Um, for the older antihistamines, five days. Yeah. Yeah, and for many children with terrible itchy skin conditions, you know, several days off an antihistamine might be a bit of a challenge, but there's no point doing these tests if you're on an antihistamine. And um, beware of over-the-counter cough medicines, which hopefully aren't being given to children, but they often have antihistamine in them. And I hope you're noticing the names of these children. You know, anaphylaxis, <laughs> rhinorrhea. Um, so again, this is probably, you know, Dad's had a day off. He's thought, oh, good. Yeah, we, we can get these done. I've got the day off. But of course, she hasn't stopped taking her antihistamines. So some general advice about antihistamines and skin prick tests is that you have to be off them. You know, I was saying a bit earlier on about skin reactions. This is, I'll, I'll tell you this because it's a little bit obscure. This is a, a dermatographometer. 
It's a clever way of doing the thing with my thumb. But it just applies a certain pressure at a certain depth. And you can seal this wheel and flare reaction. Again, not because somebody has eaten the wrong thing or taken the wrong drug. It's a manifestation of the mast cells in their skin degranulating under a physical stimulation. And that's that lady I was talking about who writes the poetry on her skin and then it all fades away and it's never seen again. So it's a bit like making a snowman. You know, it can be gorgeous and great, but it's gone the next day, never to be seen again. And she makes a living by doing it. Okay, five-month-old breastfed infant presents to you with the following skin prick test results. Test was done because on her first day for the half a spoon of runny boiled egg, she developed a wide urticarial rash all over her face and trunk. What are the chances of her having a subsequent ex um, uh, reaction if she had egg again? So we're happy with our positive control. Our negative control is truly negative and you've got an egg white reaction of eight millimeters. Let me tell you, we, we would look at that and say that was a positive reaction. Okay, could I just, um, if that was low with that history, what are the chances are of her having a subsequent reaction to egg if you offered it a month later? Very low. With that history? No, she's still positive with no reaction. Yep. So, in, so a positive result, let's say it was four millimetres, with a clear-cut history with temporal relationship of, of an IgE-mediated reaction to a clear culprit food, even a low positive test, because your, your pre-test probability is high in that instance. So even a low positive test um, gives you a high post-test probability. And that's probably a good point at which to introduce this idea that we do skin prick tests and we do specific serum IgE tests. And these are not great tests. And if they're positive, are they diagnosing allergy? No, they're not. What they're telling you is that somebody is sensitized. It. And all the time we see kids with multiple positive reactions um, and the parents say, but he's eating that every day of the week. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have the history to begin with that gives you a clinical suspicion with a high or a low pretest possibility, mm -hmm. probability, um, and interpret the test in that. This is why there's no point just doing a blanket test mm -hmm. saying let's just do everything and see if you might come up positive. You've got to have the story which makes you think of it, which makes you focus. Mm -hmm. And with this history, this is a confirmatory yeah. test. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're saying that even if it wasn't a positive test, especially that age with that reaction, a very strong possibility that this is a child that will react. And there are actually um, diagnostic cutoffs for these and you can see this child fulfills those and see how they change with age and I must admit during allergy clinics I have to constantly refer to these limits as well because I can't keep this in my brain at my age um, so I have to keep looking at those but again you wouldn't do that test unless there was a very good reason for doing it based on history and that as Shannon was saying this is a confirmatory test and it may be down the line that's giving you a useful goalpost to base on whether this might decrease and is it time for that child to have a challenge perhaps mm. true or false single most important factor in the assessment i've just told you this really <laughs> history 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 and again it's a hallmark of referrals which are difficult to process in triage when you just don't know enough about what actually mm. happened and it's easy to arrange tests without really thinking about them and we get sloppy about it so you've got to know chapter and verse about what happened, what was the child like on the day, what other medicines were they on at the time, how much of this offending food did they have, had they had that food in the past with no other issues, um, what background, atopic kind of history goes for that child and that family. Severe eczema, comes to your clinic, parents are desperate, um, nothing seems to make the eczema go away. Something is making his eczema worse, he's having daily emollients, um, various strength steroids, he takes a long-acting non-sedating antihistamine every day, he's formula fed with an occasional breastfeed at night and he hasn't otherwise started on anything other um, in terms of food. What kind of thoughts are running through your head because again this happens every day of the week. They're not doing the expert care properly. Mm -hmm. 
What does having daily emollients mean? What once a day or? Uh, okay, for the purposes of argument, let's say they are doing their level best to get the emollients on three to four times a day, and when he comes along, he's as greasy as a chip. <laughs> <laughs> so they really are trying. But something keeps his eczema going bad. You've got to find, there must be a trigger doctor, or nurse, or whatever. There's something that keeps, keeps this going. They're doing all the right things as, as recommended by a good <coughs> eczema nurse specialist. <laughs> uh, he's been going on the formula for um, six weeks and it was because mum had to go back to work but she still gives an occasional breastfeed at night but did he have severe eczema prior to that but he had eczema prior to that as well yeah there's there again history really important yeah. <coughs> and what they're fishing for is is there a magic cure? If you were to do a test and find a magic bullet that we could remove, would his eczema get better? That's, that's what they're begging for. Um, there's quite a few studies that's often quoted at big allergy meetings that if you really want to decrease your chances, you should live in a farm with a few dogs in South Germany, preferably Bavaria. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. No cats, but you can have a few dogs. The um, idea being... More importantly, the farm animals need to live under the, the house. Yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah. You've, you've got to be yeah. sharing, yeah. sharing your, 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 your sleeping arrangements with yeah. a few farm animals. Yeah. So what are you going to say to this, Mum? So again, you really want to make sure you've got all the historical details. And you do want the best possible eczema care. And again, we push the idea of these interactive eczema management plans. They're harder to do, I always feel, than allergy management plans because they're much more involved. Mm -hmm. And there's a host of creams and medicines and I have to look them up every single time. Is this an emollient? Does it have anything else in it? What are the stabilizers and preservatives? So again, it's, it's trickier to do, but it's doable. Again, a lot of people feel that antihistamines don't have a great role to play in eczema, um, that you know, there's a whole host of other mediators. Do you use them? Mm. Not for eczema. Um, quite often, what we're doing with antihistamines is that we're using first-generation antihistamines, the valigans, the promethazines, of an evening, and basically it's to try and get a decent night's sleep. But even then, you'll see these kids in bed and they're doing the eczema dance in bed. They'll be fast asleep and they'll still scratch their skin. Even if you cover up their hands and their feet, they'll do the dance. Yeah. Um, what about skin prick tests? What about altering the maternal diet? What about delaying weaning? What about um, rast testing? What about changing his milk? And I suppose the point I'm making is this is really difficult. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and it's ever such a common thing. What, I mean, what's your practical approach when somebody comes Look, with something like this? I think I'd probably be a wimp in this instance. If this child's got particularly severe eczema, I think the likelihood that this child may have comorbid food allergy, and I use that word carefully, comorbid food allergy, is probably reasonably high, and I'd probably test milk, egg, peanut. I don't know what you would do, Simon. No, I would do the same now, yeah. And so that's kind of being a bit of a wimp, because I know I have a colleague um, who, who probably wouldn't and would try and introduce foods. And I think both opinions are probably valid, but maybe I'm older school, but I would do milk, egg, peanut, but I wouldn't do an extensive array of testing. Karen? Would you put them on hydrolyzed formula? Not just off the back of that. I'd want evidence. I think it's a slippery slope. Yeah. If you go straight to a hyperallergenic formula without evidence. Mm. Would you consider changing the eczema creams? Yep. That's yeah, and a I think that probably yeah. comes to the best possible yeah. eczema care. But, but, but you're right. We see a lot of kids who are just not on strong enough steroids. Yeah. 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 But but if everything's been done, the switches have been made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah. And I suppose the point I'm making with this is that it is difficult and it's hard to get this right, um, but uh, especially in a small child with awful eczema, my threshold for at least considering a food-related underlying trigger would be less so than if this was a five-year-old five with moderate eczema. Um, and I was wondering, so in this case where you don't have a clinical clue or what you're going to test, Three would be milk, egg, yeah, and I wouldn't do more than that yeah, until I more. have more information. 
Yeah. Is that because you're worried they'll end up on a very restrictive diet? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because okay. the parents just... are desperate for a clue. Yeah. A yeah. little bit aware of the time. So what's the recommended position for insertion and use of a nasal spray? I think we're appalling at this. I think we dole these things out and expect people to know how to use them. And there is an art to it. And it's not it's not spurious either. It is absolute misery in terms of your quality of life to have very bad allergic rhinitis. And I remember as a kid myself, I remember doing exams, holding a handkerchief under my nose to stop my nose from dripping onto the exam paper. It's hideously miserable. Um, we don't do this well, I think, and we tend to gloss it over. You know, it's just a bit of hay fever. So, are you going to go straight up? Like that. Or you're going to angle it towards the septum. Or you're going to go into the nasal passage in line with the roof of the mouth. So again, sticking on a theme here, there are very good guidelines for these um, kinds of things on the ASCIA website. And that's um, a reprint from there showing the correct thing. And also just getting some very basic, straightforward clues as to how to do this. And I don't think we do this well with patients. I don't think we demonstrate it in a clinic room. I don't think we demonstrate it to parents about there is a right and a wrong way of doing it. And I think we could do better. Um, uh, and the um, eczema allergic rhinitis management plan looks like that. I think it's more complicated than it needs to be. It <laughs> emphasises that in Australia they do do nasal washouts quite a bit more than I think we do here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not a bad way to, to begin things. And it begins to address this as a, a really important issue. Again, I'm aware of the time, so we might just have to finish on this one because I think we're sort of overrunning a little bit and I don't want to eat too much into your lunch. <laughs> Skin prick tests and rast tests. They've got pros and cons. So, in a table, in your head, pick out the comments that refer either to skin prick tests or to rast tests. <coughs> so these are your two big options. You can send somebody off for a blood test um, or you can send somebody off for a skin prick test. And we'll come to both of those in a little bit. But shout out, please, which column, skin prick test or rust test, you'd put those headings? Easy one to start with. Can only be done as a blood test? Yes. All right. Can be done even if taking antihistamines? Yes. OK. Is the preferred test? Yeah, I think we'd still put that there. But there's a caveat. How many of you can actually access skin prick tests easily? There are some parts of the country where nobody is doing skin prick tests because they can't, they have no access to it. It's getting hard on the North Shore of Auckland because there's now one lab in Devonport that offers it. So if you live in Walkworth, that's a big ask. Um, and there's a whole host of reasons why that might be um, a problem. Hard to interpret with dermatographism. Oh yeah, okay. Can be done using fresh food. Yeah, if you're familiar with this technique, that there's some things we don't have reagents for or the reagents are not very good. So the trick is you get somebody to bring along the fresh fruit, you prick that, then you prick the skin. It's even better if it's crayfish or lobster or something like that <laughs> because you like prick a tiny little bit of it and then you've got a crayfish that you've somehow got to get rid of by the end of the clinic. Um, okay, needs skin unaffected by eczema. Fair enough, cheap-ish. Yeah, except you do have to have a setup, and you have to have trained people, and you have to buy the reagents and store them somewhere. So it is cheap-ish, but it's not cheap. Expensive? Yeah. I think it's about $40 per reagent. So if you're asking for 10 of them, that's $400. Um, is diagnostic. Bearing in mind what we've been saying. Oh, sorry, gives immediate result. That's easy. So diagnostic and no risks. There is a very small risk that in some children, skin prick tests may be something that's best done under hospital circumstances, but it's tiny. Say again? Yeah, we had a child who was given an epilepsis three weeks ago. We got an epilepsis for a skin prick test. He was two years old for rhinorrhea, so wow. fever. Mm. Being tested for dust mites and other 
sort of environmental factors and he had an anaphylactic reaction. Mm. The doctor from the medical centre came over and gave him a dinner. Mm. Which is why these centres that do skin testing are always located yeah. next to a GP yeah. practice. So he was very young and yeah. he was and for doing skin prick testing in the first place, but yeah. he had a full on anaphylactic collapse, it was pale. And that's thankfully very uncommon. And where it has been in the report in the literature, and we're talking about less than 1% of skin yeah, testing. It was very rare, and it gave yep. everybody a terrible fright. That's what we thought about everybody. Yeah. Never yeah. Seen that yeah. But what I was going to say, interestingly, people think that if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to a food that the child's had anaphylaxis to before. But where it has been reported in the literature, rarely, is to inhalants. That's really interesting. Mm. We're like, oh, that's weird. How are we going to do with that? Mm. <laughs> Not skin testing on that child again. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would also counter the no risks for RAS tests or what we call serum specific IgE testing now um, because getting a result where that you, where you don't know what to do with that result or where you're going to embark on extensive ex exclusions in a child that's tolerant isn't without risk. Yeah, but um, I know that's not what Simon's saying, but just to drive that message home. Yeah. Um, but again, you can see how that particular lab that does skin prick tests is going to be thinking twice about whether they're going to carry on doing it in children under the age of two. Mm. Um, so in terms of it di being diagnostic, I don't think you can say that. We've said this already. These are supportive tests. They're looking to confirm a suspicion. They're not diagnostic. And we must never diagnose things on these tests alone. And they don't um, predict, oh, sorry, there Simon, you go. there you go. So <laughs> neither of them, um, sorry, with both of them, the positivity of the test is proportional to the likelihood that this is a true allergy. But please notice that if you've got a skin prick test of 15, that doesn't mean you're three times more likely to have a severe reaction than somebody who has a skin prick test of five. It gives you no gu guide as to the severity. And some of the worst anaphylactic kids have had very mediocre mm. skin prick tests. So it doesn't predict severity. And that's quite an important message for parents as well who say, oh, 25, that must be really bad. It's just not good enough to be able to do that. Um, uh, so they don't predict severity of reaction. It's, is it positive? Is it negative? Does it fit with the clinical history? Can I put these two pieces of a jigsaw together and make a diagnosis? And again, the importance of pretest probability. And I think of age as well, that a reaction which is smaller but significant in a child who's six months old is always going to be more important than in a, an older child. And your clinical suspicion um, is going to be influenced as well by um, just how good the story was in interpreting the, the results. So this is leading on to um, a discussion about some of the things we talked about, about alternative milks. So this is a four month old, they're all four months old. Um, fully <laughs> breastfed, eximitous boy. First taste of yogurt. Develops widespread wheels with a H all over his face and trunk. Very itchy. Eyes were swollen, lips were swollen. No involvement of cardiovascular system, respiratory or gastro symptoms. So is this anaphylactic or non-anaphylactic? On the information that we've got at the moment, we'd say this was non-anaphylactic. One week later does exactly the same with a nibble on a piece of cheese. All symptoms came on within 10 minutes and they settled spontaneously without any specific treatment apart from not eating any more of that food. So what are your first thoughts? You've taken this history, you've got this story. Does this sound like it's a good case? It's for real? Is there any other alternative diagnosis you could make here? Or would this fulfill your clinical criteria for a diagnosis? That's a pretty strong story, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Yeah, OK. And again, we don't have any tests or anything like that at the moment. But his mum's got to go back to work, and breastfeeding is not going to be feasible um, during the day. She's going to be at work. This is a common scenario. Um, so she's going to have to use a formula feed. So what are your recommendations going to be? I guess once you've confirmed on testing that yeah. your suspicion... Let's say he's, he's had some skin prick tests done, and they're strongly supportive that this is a cow's milk protein allergy. Would. It's a really good sto story. I would. Th this is a really good story. Um, so clearly, this child's going to be cow's milk allergic. 
I would always confirm it because there may be, you know, there's sometimes where we see people who we go, this is a really good story, have negative, repeatedly negative testing, do a food challenge on them and it's fine. It's not going to be the case here, granted, but I would do confirmatory testing. Personally. Do you test the soil or anything else? Ah. <laughs> um, no. No. Oh, look, in some instances in the past I would have, um, because it would be a good option once this child's over six months of age. Um, but would I test for soy at this point in time now in my current practice? No. I, I do know what you mean though, because sometimes you get a story which is so strong that you think, if this skin prick test was negative, it's am I going to believe the skin prick test or but am I going to believe the child? But if it was, if it was negative, I would... I would try, I wouldn't challenge at this age, I'd try a hypoallergenic formula appropriate for the age of the child and retest later on to confirm. Okay, so any other thought? What happened in your circumstances? What milk were you? Yeah. And which one? Uh, okay. Excellent. So again, this is often something that needs a little bit of multidisciplinary discussion, um, but I, I think again, people's individual experience of all these milks. It is a little bit confusing at times. So any other advances on a four-month-old? Would you go for Pepti Junior? Would you go for soy? Would you go for goat's milk? Would you go for some other clever stuff? How are you going to get hold of this and how much does it cost? Would you like to tell us how much a can of Pepti Junior costs? <laughs> uh, good, um, yeah. Uh, Appropriately. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody? Um, uh, any ideas how much a tin of Neocate costs? It's not a big tin. Ah, uh, it's more than that. I think it's about 130. Yeah. Week in, week out. Uh, most parents can't do that. That's right. Yeah. Rather disturbingly, I did notice a few nights ago that people were selling Neocate on Trade Me. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, what are the recommendations at this age with this story? And again, this is the um, uh, this is the Kemp paper, which I think has been pretty well universally adopted through ASCIA mm -hmm. as well. Um, and they give a first and a second choice there. So um, uh, our, our child is probably fitting into that immediate food allergy group with an onset of reaction within an hour. Um, uh, and interestingly, what they're saying there is exclude this protein from the maternal diet that they're saying using an extensively hydrolyzed formula if for the child who's under six months with an amino acid formula as their second choice most of Comments? us wouldn't recommend maternal elimination if the baby's not adversely affected and i think again this this is a very broad picture so um I, I, again if you do the simple things and the baby is still reacting, you might reconsider that. But it's a big ask for a mother to mm. say, no dairy for you for the foreseeable future. Okay, when we talk about amino acid formulas, which one are they? Which, what, what's our favorite amino acid formula? Formulas. Mia Kate and... Okay, anybody ever tasted them? <laughs> I didn't. F I found the flavoured one. The tro I think it's. Is it tropical? Yeah. wasn't wasn't too bad. Yeah. Um, but then I'll eat anything. Um, uh, but, but again, you know, some kids just cannot tolerate these things. We even have to use nasogastric feeds sometimes with some of these kids in the past. They they are hideous. Yeah. They don't actually taste like milk. Um, okay. And we've said our favourite. Oh, one of our favourites. Sort of. Um, uh, uh, extensively hydrolyzed foods. Um, you can see if you're talking about anaphylaxis, you go straight to the amino acid formulas. Yeah. And Pharmac now have very clear um, special authority criteria in terms of whether or not a child meets criteria under or over six months for indication and with reassessment every six months. So let's say this child goes on to near Kate and he's fine, but he's now 18 months old. You're going to carry on with the near Kate? Are you going to try something else? What about soy? How old are we? 18 months? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, wouldn't well, you would think so, but actually in real life, I, I think most parents are pretty assiduous when they've got these kinds of things. So, so yes, you do see accidental exposures and they can be helpful, um, but probably not as often as you think, or not admitted to anyway. Yeah. I think I would have taken the child back to eight months in terms of the decision you're Oh, all right, we'll take him back to eight months. Yeah. <laughs> all right, he's eight months then. Yeah. What does Pharmac say? The pharmac are very keen on the it. idea of, you know, of a ladder approach that at different ages you go to a different level of, of, of care and so on. Um, so I think the pharmac approach would be to consider um, sort of the Pepti Junior kind of milk or perhaps even soy. So with, the, with this child, an extensively hydrolyzed formula, in other words Pepti Junior, would be indicated under six months of age because there wasn't anaphylaxis and that's what the pharmac guidelines say. At eight months of age, so at six months after prescribing, there needs to be a reassessment, which can be a reassessment by a GP or dietitian, um, that needs to be re-evaluated. And clearly, this child could transition to soy formula at eight months of age. And that's what the pharma guidelines would say. Mm. So who likes soy formulas? There's probably people in this room who have soy milk, but there were some worries about soy formulas, um, especially in terms of uh, phytoestrogens, plant-derived estrogens that were in them. Uh, the fact that it was, you know, another protein source, and that some children might be allergic to soy as well as cow's milk. Um, but it's still down in the recommendations, and it's a lot easier to source and get hold of. And actually, they're really good. I don't know if you're getting to it. Long-term studies um, that have shown that. There are no untoward endocrine effects 30 years later. Yeah, so with soy is safe if you're safe with soy. Yeah. You could actually uh, um, encourage mum to express. You could do, but, sh but I don't know if that was an I'm option. Just saying, you know, like <laughs> but really at some point, an alternative to add into oh, things or to have an alternative yeah. is useful. Yeah, but um, Absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're not suggesting that breastfeeding needs to cease. Yeah. Um, not at all. But useful alternatives. Yeah. Um, I think really importantly, and we never, Simon didn't really expand on this, although I think you meant to, was that mammalian milks need to be avoided. Yeah. And again, just to close on. Where do you look for um, advice? Well, we've mentioned a few places, but please be aware there's an awful lot of information out there, and some of it is very good quality indeed. So, as a recommendation, Dermnet NZ, worth its weight in gold. It's free, great pictures, used all around the world. People from Europe come and say, oh, Dermnet, that's that thing from New Zealand. It is very good for skin conditions generally, so strongly recommend that you know about it. Um, the other thing is kids' health. Uh, it's got some nice bits on allergy as well, very parent orientated as well, so keep that in mind. A third source is BPAC, especially for sort of the GP minded of you. Um, uh, uh, again, I think a little bit more of an adult rather than a childhood bent, but yeah, still quite a lot of useful information in there too. Um, Askia, I keep blowing its trumpet, but it's because it's good and I use it all the time and it's free. And they've got some very nice handouts and printouts. And look at the courses as well. Very straightforward and easy to do. Um, and uh, I think we were both involved in this paper. This is IgE mediated. There's also a follow on patient about non IgE mediated, which is a bit of a minefield for practitioners. But I think this is still quite a good um, summary document about the situation in New Zealand and with some very readable, very straightforward, not too long. Um, and again, um, like I say, this is the non IgE mediated one, which is now being published. Um, and Starship guidelines are down there as well. They're easy, they're free, they come up on all the search engines. There's a good anaphylaxis um, uh, Starship guideline there as well, probably aimed a little bit more at hospital-based practitioners. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to close up on this because it's a nice picture. Um, so, father's heard that his peanut allergic child may also have reactions to other similar foods. What can you tell him? So what kind of food group is peanut? All right, grows in the ground, related to legumes like soy and peas and beans and things like that. Um, so what are you going to tell him about his peanut allergic child? What about other nuts? Peanuts grow in the ground, tree nuts grow on trees. 
So it's bizarre, but a significant percentage of children who are peanut allergic will have allergic to other nuts, true nuts, tree nuts. But which ones? You don't know. And these days, you know, it's not unusual for children to eat pecan and macadamia and pistachio and so on and so on. So what can you tell them about such reactions? Here's a useful slide. 25 to 50% with a peanut allergy will have a nut allergy, but to which nut? And again, it's a purely practical thing, and I suspect you do the same as well. But quite often I'll say, just avoid all nuts, at least until we know what's going yeah. on. If there's a specific pointer to a specific nut, that's fine. If a parent says he eats Nutella every morning for breakfast, I can't see the point in banning him from that, and you may be doing him harm, not good. Um, but just keep in mind that that's quite a big overlap. 50% with a nut allergy will be allergic to more than one nut. But again, which nuts? I was in clinic the other day with the um, allergy nurse specialist, and she just showed them a picture of all of the different nuts. This kid was only three, and I couldn't believe how many because it was exactly the same mm. question. Child mm. was allergic to peanuts, and they were asked exactly the same question. But this child, who was only three, had actually almost eaten all of the other mm. nuts. Yeah, and that's yeah. entirely appropriate for that child, yeah. and yes. and for that yeah. family. Yeah. Um, and the child if was regularly exposed to a lot of other nuts. Mm. And if a family want to know, and the negative on testing to tree nuts, yeah. um, I, and they want to introduce, I would, I would completely be in favour of that. Bearing in mind, they need to be careful of cross reactivity, or, sorry, contamination um, yeah. and confusion. And you also don't want to confuse the child. But if that child's been well educated and isn't confused, that's fine. Um, she did test the ones they had not been exposed to. Yep. But and again, I would have limited my testing to those. Yeah. Yep. Again, um, one that I think I sometimes neglect, but 15% <coughs> with peanut um, mm. will also have sesame. And I think sesame features quite highly mm. at Starship's population as well. So again, it's just worth keeping those in mind because you're not, probably not going to say no nuts, but you might not say no sesame or let's explore sesame, or let's think about sesame. Um, so um, again, that's a sort of useful Venn diagram to have there. Um, I see, I think, a disproportionate number of people who've opted for goat's milk, which I'm sure is a fantastic milk if you're a goat. Um, but I don't see any advantages in goat's milk otherwise. It smells, and to me, of goat and tastes a bit of goat as well. Um, it's not great for folate. It's not humanized in many preparations, although you can buy more expensive ones, which are. But as far as I can see, goat's milk is good for goats. But I, I don't think I've ever recommended anybody to go to goat's milk, and I've told a lot of people to try and come off it. But it's one of those things people do when they're a bit desperate. In terms of the other cross-reactivities, I think this is a great chart. And if you look down the side there, you can see by the red bars where the big overlaps are. And sure enough, if you look here for goat's milk and cow's milk, 92% cross-reactivity. So are you doing anybody any favors by recommending goat's milk when they've got a 92% chance that there might be cross-reactivity? And I can't remember all of those, but um, I'd love to find that as a wall chart for my office because it's really useful. Can we get a copy of that? Um, you can get a copy yeah, of the Well, I think you'll have a copy of these slides. And I think I just got that off, you know, Dr. Webb um, <laughs> kind of thing, Dr. Internet. Um, so it's freely available, but it's a great chart. Remember we were talking about the oral allergy thing as well, where you may have allergies to birch and ragweed, but you also have cross-reactivities to some foods as well, um, which I don't see very much of, but I think much more in the South Island. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, so that's a great chart. Um, so, yes, this is easily available, and you can certainly cut and paste it from this talk. Um, now, I think, <laughs> in terms of timing, it would be dangerous to overload you with information. You've been very patient now. You probably want your lunch, patient. which I'm told is usually very tasty. But are there any sort of last-minute burning issues or questions uh, that we need to answer now? Because if not, myself and Shannon are both going to be around over lunchtime if you particularly want to discuss individualised cases. But I think in the interests of time, we'll probably call it a day there.